I was a pretty brave person when I was younger, or <laughs> maybe I had that sense of invincibility that comes with youth. I'd survived some things, like a stalker who pursued my sister and I for over a year and a half, being sexually assaulted, two house fires, and growing up in a house that I swear to you was haunted. Not in that Disney way, either. I'm talking torture chamber in the basement and strange things going on. Anyway, I suppose, looking back, that having been through all of that made me feel a little like either I was sort of invincible, or maybe I just assumed that I'd gotten all the bad stuff out of the way and nothing else would happen. Whatever it was, I learned to know better. When I was 17, I didn't have a driver's license. In fact, I was 36 before I did. I walked most places, occasionally catching rides with friends, and less occasionally, hitchhiking. The night in question was one of those seldom seen occasions when I decided to hitchhike, having worked late and being too exhausted to walk. Now, most of the time when I'd hitch a ride, I wouldn't get in the car with a lone man. Only women, or rarely, men with a wife or a girlfriend or kids in the car. This night, though, Cars were few and far between, and it was cold, and really, if I'm being perfectly frank, when we pulled over I took a good look and figured I could take him if he tried anything. He was on the skinny side and had a strange frailness about him, even though he looked healthy enough. I got into the car after we agreed on a destination. We exchanged names and I warmed my fingers in front of the heating vent. He spoke quietly asking a few questions along the lines of if I was a local and how did I like living there. He said he'd only been there a couple of months but found it beautiful and hoped he would find happiness there. That comment struck me as a little odd but I brushed it off. It began to snow and the road got slippery so he slowed and kept his eyes straight out the windshield driving silently. I was okay with that as small talk was never really my thing. About 10 minutes later, I noticed a car near the intersection we were approaching seemed to be sliding, so I yelled at him to watch out. He immediately hit the gas, shooting through the intersection and burst out with, DON'T EVER SCREAM AT ME! Needless to say, I was taken back a bit. I said, look, this is close enough, just pull over here and I can get out. He didn't seem to hear me. Um, Richard, did... Did you hear me? I said you can pull over there and let me out. No response. He just stared straight ahead, driving faster now than he had been since it began to snow. To say I was scared doesn't seem to cover the depth of fear that began to arise in me. I didn't know if I should stay quiet or speak, but I was damn sure not going to yell after his outburst. After about a mile, he began to mumble under his breath. I couldn't quite make out what he was saying, but I assumed he was speaking to me, so I said, Sorry, I couldn't hear you. He began to speak quietly and rapidly, saying things like, You're always yelling at me. I've told you time and time again. I do not appreciate being yelled at, but do you listen? No. Well, I'm done listening to you now. Do you hear that? I was at a complete loss. I didn't know what to say in response or if I should say anything at all. I contemplated just jumping out of the car but got rid of that idea when I realized that the door lock was missing. There was just a silver lined hole where it should have been. I'd started to cry and debate with myself about causing an accident by grabbing the wheel and hoping for the best. At least, I figured, there was a chance I'd survive that. When he suddenly looked at me for the first time since I had gotten into the car, he blinked several times rapidly, then slowed the car, pulling into a gas station. I waited to see if he'd unlocked the doors, not wanting to say anything to set him off again. After a minute or two, he quietly said, I think I better let you out here, and hit the button to open the locks. I wasn't about to hesitate. I jumped out of the car as if it were on fire. I was about to turn and walk into the gas station when he called my name. He looked so damn sad I hesitated. He apologized, said he was sorry if he'd frightened me, that he would never have harmed me, and asked if I'd be able to get home okay. 
I said I would, and closed the door. He began to pull out of the gas station lot, but stopped suddenly. He just sat there for a couple of moments, his head down. I froze, wondering what the hell he was up to and was about to run into the station, but he opened his window and yelled to me, waving something in his hand. It was my hat. I'd apparently left it on his seat. I warily approached his side of the car and he handed it to me, apologizing again. I didn't know what else to say, so I just said, thanks. I watched as he drove off, making sure he was out of sight before moving on so he wouldn't know which direction I was heading. I decided to go to a friend's house instead of home. As I walked, I went to put my hat back on and out fell a piece of paper. Folded into the paper was a $100 bill. The paper said, I'm sorry, please take a cab and don't hitchhike anymore tonight. I didn't. In fact, it was the last time I ever hitched a ride alone. This story comes from a woman named Jennifer. This happened in 1985 when I was 17 years old. I was the youngest of my graduating class and all summer I had been looking at colleges across the region. This is long enough ago that there wasn't any internet and if you wanted to go to college out of state and you didn't have tons of money or connections, you'd actually have to take a trip. I was born in Seattle, but at this time my family had been living in Mount Shasta, which is a small town in Northern California. I was unable to attend college on time with the rest of my friends because I ended up having to stay home and take care of my mother. She ended up being diagnosed with cancer at the end of summer and my dad had to continue working 10 hour days in order to pay the bills. So I took care of my mom for a year while my dad worked. Luckily, my mom didn't have to suffer for long. The cancer had progressed so far by the time they caught it that she passed in the fall. After my mother passed away, my dad made sure I started college as soon as possible. I knew I wanted to go to school in Seattle because the big city life was just calling to me. My dad basically handed me $500 and the keys to his old 1982 Chevrolet pickup and told me to go, and that when I got there he'd send me money to get an apartment so I could make my way in the city before school started. He didn't want any obstacles in my way when it came to school. He felt guilty for having me home while my mom was dying. Not that I would have chosen to be anywhere else, but he was still feeling guilty. So, in the middle of fall, I ended up driving my dad's truck north to Seattle. The trip is basically a straight shot from Mount Shasta to Seattle on Interstate 5. It should have been easy, but about halfway through Oregon, the pickup broke down. A coolant hose sprung a leak and I was unable to repair it on the side of the road. So, I ended up having to walk on the side of the interstate northward in the direction of the next town. I had just passed a small town named Green a while back and the map said I was just south of a medium sized town named Roseburg. I couldn't be sure how far away from Roseburg I was, but walking wasn't a problem for me and Roseburg would be much more likely to have a repair shop, so even if it might be further away, it was totally worth the attempt. It was cold that evening, and the wind chill was cutting through my coat and causing me to hate life. I decided it would be best to hitch a ride to Roseburg since it was getting dark fairly quickly. I thought I looked pretty damn hot back then, but still, no one stopped to give me a lift. I kept walking north and putting my thumb out every time a car came up behind me. It was hours later when one finally stopped. It was a big red 18-wheeler that had no trailer attached. It pulled up in front of me and off to the side of the road and honked its horn. I ran up to the truck thankful that I could finally get out of the wind. As I opened the passenger side door of the truck, I saw a very friendly looking man at the wheel. He smiled and said, come on up inside, as I climbed into the passenger seat. He told me his name was Rick and I introduced myself in return. He asked me where I was headed and I told him I needed to get to Roseburg to get a tow truck to pick up my vehicle I left a few miles back. 
He told me he'd been to Roseburg many times on his routes and that there wasn't a repair shop or tow truck company open this late at night. He told me he would let me out at a motel so I could sleep the night and then get the tow truck to pick up my vehicle the next morning. I thanked him for his considerate nature. He really did seem kind and thoughtful. We weren't far from Roseburg according to him, which made sense because we could just now begin seeing the signs of civilization amongst the trees on the side of the interstate. We made small talk while he drove the rest of the way. We discussed the cold weather, current events, and even sports. Somewhere in the conversation, he told me that I was very pretty. It caught me off guard, but he didn't say it in a creepy manner, so I merely thanked him and continued talking about sports. He didn't say anything after that. Kind of just let me talk. You know that feeling you get when you realize you've been chatting on and on about something and the other person hasn't said a word for a few minutes? Well, I got that feeling because he hadn't said a word since he told me I was pretty. I stopped and apologized for being so chatty and talking his ear off. He looked at me, smiled, and said, It was alright. He likes to hear my pretty voice. That time, he did say it in a creepy way, but sometimes that happens. I doubted he meant to do that. I kept quiet in hopes that he'd start talking and we'd discuss something else. But instead, we didn't say a word. He watched the road and I just sat there. In a minute, I began looking around the cab and I ended up looking in the back of the cab behind me. What I saw puzzled me. In the back, there was a large brown blanket, some clothes I'm sure were dirty, and some shoes. The thing that puzzled me was they weren't all his clothes and shoes. Two pairs of the shoes were obviously little girl's shoes and some of the clothes were little girl's clothes. Something you'd expect a 10 year old to wear. He knew that I'd seen it and laughed. He told me his daughter left those in the cab after she had accompanied him on a route last week. He told me he didn't get enough time to spend with her so he took her on a route a week ago to spend some quality time together. I said that it was nice of him and asked how old she was. He paused for a second and then told me that she was 13. That made me suspicious because not only did he hesitate before answering, but I've worked in a shoe store before and I know those shoes must belong to a much younger girl, both because of the size and the style. It also didn't seem like the kind of clothes or shoes you'd have a little girl bring on a trip like this. It was weird, but not scary. Also, having worked at a shoe store before, I was almost positive those shoes were two different sizes. I told him the shoes were cute and leaned back and grabbed one of them and proved to myself that they had to be different sizes and no way does a little girl wear two totally different sizes. Still, I wasn't really scared, I just thought he wasn't being completely honest with me and that's his business so I didn't really mind it. It's just a weird thing to be dishonest about, even to a stranger. I put the shoe back and when I turned around I saw the look on his face. He seemed half worried and half angry. I immediately apologized for touching his things and he said it was okay, although it didn't look okay. By then we were just entering Roseburg. We kept driving through the town and he told me he knew a good motel on the far end of town and that he'd let me off there. He asked me what I had brought with me in my backpack. It seemed like an innocent question, but it came off like he was interested in what I had on me. Not simply whether or not I'd brought any clothes or a toothbrush. I told him I had enough, but I didn't tell him anything specific about the contents of my backpack. I didn't have a weapon of any type, just some socks, makeup, and my purse. We ended up passing a repair shop on the side of the road and he pointed to it and told me that's the place I should go to tomorrow morning to get a tow truck. It felt kind of strange to me because he didn't tell me it was coming up, he just sort of pointed to it. I said I had missed it and asked what the name of the shop was. He responded by just telling me it was straight south off the interstate and that I can't miss it, as if he didn't remember the name or something. At this point, I began to get a little worried. I didn't feel threatened by Rick, but he didn't seem to be legit with me. 
As we kept driving, I noticed we were now coming to the far north end of Roseburg and that soon we'd be leaving the town behind. I asked him where this motel is and he told me it was just north of town. I told him that was a little far from the repair shop for me and asked if there was any place closer for me to stay, but he didn't answer. Now I'm a little worried about Rick's intentions for me. I got my backpack and put it on my lap. He looked over and saw it and asked if I was okay. I looked over and smiled at him and told him I was okay, just a little bit cold. You know those signs on the highway that tell you how far off the next rest stop, gas station, or motel is? Well, they had those back then too, but usually only on the outskirts of town. It's the town's way of motivating you to stop for gas or somewhere where they can tax it, rather than continuing on and sleeping somewhere unincorporated. Well, we came up on one of those signs. It said there wouldn't be a motel for 20 miles and that we were leaving Roseburg. I knew then that Rick wasn't taking me to a motel just past the town's limit. I didn't know what he wanted, but I just didn't want it to happen. I looked over slowly at Rick and luckily he hadn't seen the sign, I, I think, because he was busy lighting a cigarette. I began frantically looking out the window to see if there were any places I could make an excuse to stop at. Maybe I could ask to stop at a gas station for something to drink and then run away. There wasn't one open. I decided I'd have to pull out the big guns and ask him to pull over so I could pee. I looked over at him and asked if he'd pull over to let me pee on the side of the road. He pulled his lit cigarette out of his mouth and looked at me. He asked, You gotta pee? And I shook my head yes. Well, go ahead and pee then, Jenny, he told me. I like the smell, and he smiled at me and it sent shivers down my spine. I pretended to laugh like it was some weird joke or something and he just frowned at me. Don't fucking laugh at me, Jenny, he told me. I immediately stopped pretending to be fine and so did Rick. He could tell I was scared now and he just gave me this look like he wanted to hit me or something. I asked him where we were going and he told me not to worry about it. At this point I could actually see the end of Roseburg coming up ahead. No more lights after that, just woods. Immediately I heard my dad's voice in my head telling me to run, not to worry about getting hurt, just, just run. I opened the door and tried to jump out. The truck must have been moving at 30 to 40 miles per hour and as I moved towards the open door, Rick grabbed my backpack. He had been trying to grab me but I was pressed against the far end of the cab. I heard my dad's voice again telling me to run and I tried to pull my backpack away from Rick but his grip was too strong. I gave up and just fell back out of the cab and into the grass. The impact knocked the wind out of me and I rolled around in the grass till I came to a stop. Immediately I sat up, despite the sharp pain in my back and saw Rick's truck speeding up his way out of the town. He didn't stop. I got up and limped my way back into town and ran up to the first home I saw and pounded on the front door. An old man opened the door looking very tired yet also very worried. I begged him to call the cops and when he saw the bruises on my face and grass stains on my clothes, he threw open the door and let me come in. He sat me on the couch while he ran to the phone. His wife came down to find me on the couch crying and him on the phone telling the local sheriff to come as soon as possible. She got me a glass of water and a blanket. They were both so nice to me. The sheriff arrived and expected me to be drunk at first. About halfway through my story, he realized I wasn't drunk and there was truth to the story I was telling. He called up two deputies who were asleep at home and had them patrol north on the interstate looking for a big red 18-wheeler. He even called up the next town north and asked them to send a patrol south. They didn't find any red 18-wheelers on the road, but they assumed he probably sped his way right through their town too before they were able to send out a patrol. The nice old couple who had let me in ended up letting me stay with them. I did stay in contact with the sheriff and the old couple who helped me. The old couple both passed away about a year and a half later. I went to their funerals and spoke to their kids who were about my dad's age at the time and told them everything their parents had done for me. They were very proud of their parents. I even stayed at their home on my way back down from Seattle when I eventually brought my dad's truck back to him. 
The sheriff would call me from time to time and ask if he could send me some photos. It seemed like every now and then he would arrest a trucker who had a red semi or similar vehicle and he would want to see if I recognized him. He says that Rick probably didn't frequent that route as much as he said he did because he didn't seem too familiar with the town, which is one reason I was so suspicious of him. Odds are, Rick was a crazy serial killer or at least a child abductor and sexual predator. But he travels the whole United States and there is no way to know where he is now. At the time I suspected he was around 40, which means he would be in his 70s now and probably no longer on the road. The sheriff told me many years later that there are tons of old folks in retirement homes who have no families and no one ever visits them. Rick is probably living that kind of life now, if he even still is alive. Wherever Rick is now, I hope he never really hurt anyone, or at least I hope he never hurt anyone ever again. But if he did, especially if he did hurt the two little girls whose clothes he had in his truck, then I hope that wherever he is now, he's suffering and alone. Hey everyone, so all of you are probably wondering, what the fuck corpse, you haven't uploaded in two weeks, why do you hate us so much? Well, if you were following me on social media like Twitter and Snapchat like a good subscriber, you'd know why. I've had the worst luck the past couple weeks, my steering wheel locked while I was driving, I almost got into an accident and now my car is not working again. I've had to go into the doctors pretty frequently and I'm getting blood work done which you all saw on my snapchat story. Sorry to those who are afraid of needles and stuff, I forgot to put a warning. I've had some pretty scary things going on with my throat. I also got confirmed for GERD and I'm being put on medication but still have to probably have a camera down my throat because they want to rule out some things before giving me x-rays to avoid radiation if they can. My girlfriend got really sick, I was trying to take care of her like a good boyfriend and she got me sick so now I'm just starting to get my voice back. In case you haven't noticed if you compare like the beginning of this video to my voice now it's like going out. My stepbrother's appendix almost burst and now he's really sick and constantly coughing and being loud in the room next to me which I'm not mad about, it's obviously not his fault, it's just another obstacle when recording. Not to mention we have this whole El Nino thing going on and my power got shut down mid-recording for this video. I lost about an hour or so of recording, which is a ton when you're just getting your voice back. Anyways, while all of this is going on, the thing that's constantly on my mind is, what are my subscribers on YouTube thinking? Do they even know that this is going on? This is why it is very important for you to follow me on Snapchat and Twitter and all my other social media. It makes me feel a lot better knowing you at least know why I haven't uploaded. I also want to thank all of you that sent me stuff to my P.O. box. I was having a pretty terrible day and I decided to go check it to see if I got anything and I got the most random stuff from all over the world and I appreciate it so much. So shout out to all of you that sent stuff, it really means the world to me. For anyone that wants to send me anything besides money, don't send that. My P.O. box is in the description. But yeah, that's pretty much everything that's been going on. I hope you all understand and know that I appreciate you sticking around even when I'm going through tough times like this. Those of you who share my videos with your friends or on social media are the absolute best. I hope I can continue to grow with the help of you guys so that I can keep putting out content that you enjoy frequently. Hope you liked the video, sorry if my voice seemed off, and stay safe and have an awesome day.